Hi, my name is Z and I'm an alcoholic. Z. Z. Uh, my sobriety date is September 20th, 2011. So that means I'm like 12 years and some change. Uh, I have a sponsor <laughs> and I had a home group, but I need a new home group since I just moved here. But those are kind of the three things that I say at the beginning of every share because those three things have stood me in good stead. Um, it's weird, weird being here now, weird sharing this room. I've shared a few milestones at this meeting all the way back to my first year. Um, yeah, the biggest problem I've ever had in my life has been solved, which is, which is crazy. Um, because I just, I was, I was one of those hopeless alcoholics, you know, there was no hope for me. Uh, and the fact that that problem has been solved is miraculous. And I need to remember that because it's been a long time since I've taken a drink. Um, and sometimes it feels far away, you know. Um, but I think for me today, it's really about the spiritual malady, you know. Uh, I shared about it the other day. <clears throat> My sponsor said to me, he described the spiritual malady as deep down inside of me as the fundamental belief that I'm not okay, you know. And that has been with me in the beginning, and that still is with me to this day. Um, and I'm not okay, I don't fit in, no one likes me, I don't have any friends. Um, and, um, you know, that still, ha that still exists today, even though I've put the drugs and alcohol down. And that's the reason why I use the program today, because I have to treat that, you know, the spiritual side of this disease. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so it's good thing. It's it's good to, for me to note that. Um, the react, you know, the honest truth is, I loved drinking. I loved it. I loved getting messed up. I loved I loved waking up in places where I didn't know where I was, or if I had one shoe missing or whatever. I remember waking up one day and I was in this room and I was like, "Where is it? Where am I?" You know, I couldn't figure it out. And about like a minute later, I realized I was in my own bedroom. <laughs> like. I like that, you know, I liked what alcohol did for me. I like, I like um, who it made me, you know, because I was super shy and I'm still shy to a certain extent. Awkward, uncomfortable, and alcohol, you know, was my solution for a long time. It made me feel like I was somebody that I was, it, 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 made, li it made life make sense. I was like, oh, okay, now I get it, you know, I can fit in, I can, you know, have the confidence that I was looking for, speak to the girl, um, you know, feel part of something, you know, and so it was for me a, lo a lot of the struggle <laughs> to give up alcohol was was about accepting, uh, surrendering to the fact that I had to let that go. You know, it was difficult. Um, I started drinking in high school a little bit. It wasn't a problem. I went on a gap year to Israel after I finished school, drank a lot of cheap Israeli vodka, um, but still, it was never really an issue. You know, I hadn't crossed that invisible line. Um, I could still take it or leave it. Um, I got back from um, Israel, I went to university, continued drinking, and then that's when it kind of happened. At some stage in my like first or second year of university, um, I crossed that, that invisible line, um, and uh, I couldn't go back, you know. And the disease kind of progressed for me. It started with like, you know, drinking twice a week, then it would be like, drink like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then it became like every night, every day, and then I would wake up in the morning, and I would have to have a drink to get my day started. And like that, honestly, the average day for me, at the worst of my drinking was like, I'd get up, I'd go to my refrigerator, see whatever is left booze I'd have, I'd go sit in my, fr in my shower, because I drank a lot in my shower, my shower had like beer cans in it, um, so I'd sit all fucked up having my drink or whatever uh, And then I'd start my day and then my you know I was dating somebody at the time and she was like Basically looking after me, you know, because I couldn't really hold my life together and um, I'd bump some money off of her and I'd go and I do what I would do what I have to do to like kind of drink during the, the, the day Eventually probably passing out and I have to get up and do it all over again and during this time it was like lying manipulating, you know stealing um, <clears throat> you know, just doing what I had to do to maintain my drinking, um, hating myself. And it's weird because I, like I said, I don't know how I crossed that line because 
in the beginning of, of my university, like I would go to all my classes and I would do well and people would like me and I was like the life of the party. And then all of a sudden it was like, no one wants to be around me. Um, start missing my classes, flunking, um, you know, not showing up for work, making excuses, not showing up for work, using whatever I could. You know, I remember when my mom, my mom had cancer and I would use that, like, oh, my mom, I have to go look after my mom, I can't come into work today. Like, you know, that's kind of where I devolved, you know. And there were a couple of moments where I had that realization, you know, like I remember once I, I, I had this job in Cape Town and I was delivery, I was the delivery guy. And I was in a parking lot somewhere and I bought a bottle of vodka and I was kind of like drinking out the bottle. And I looked up and there was this lady walking by and she just gave me the look of like, not even like anger, just like, what the, like, what? You know? And, um, you know, I'd get that look every now and again from people, you know? <coughs> so I knew something was going on, you know? I knew my drinking wasn't normal. Um, and uh, I think in like, when I was like 25, 26, my girlfriend at the time left me. And in hindsight, I don't blame her. You know, she, I was not stopping and she wanted to have a life. And she, she moved on and had a life. And, and, you know, and I can't blame her for that. But that really sent me into a downward spiral where I was just like suicidal. And like, it was just, it was just bad. And that kind of triggered my whole bout of like, okay, I'm going to go to rehab now. I went to rehab for the first time in 2005. I stayed for two weeks. I was fully cured. My dad, my dad bought a bar, and he was like, "You're gonna run this bar." I was like, "Yes, I'm ready." <laughs> and uh, so, and I was in uh, in Durban, and um, so I got out and I ran this bar, and it was a nightmare for like a year. It was insane. I'd come to work to do like um, stock take or whatever. Like it was an Irish bar, so I had like a Guinness, a Downing Guinness, um, drinking whiskey. It was just like crazy um uh, and then six months later i was like broken then i went to rehab and this time second time i went to rehab i really genuinely wanted to quit i genuinely had an intention to quit um and i was like i showed up at all the classes i asked all the questions uh you know i finished the rehab i got out i was like ready you know two weeks later i was drinking again you know and that for me made me realize like oh shit you know this thing is bigger than me because i had really pure intentions of not stopping and that's kind of was like the pattern i was in you know it's like i would i would go eventually i went to rehab again and i got i got clean again and then i started going to meetings for gen, genuinely for the first time and then i would do like 30 days i was on like z's 30 day relapse program i'd do like 30 days i'd, I'd drink disappear whatever three four five days later wake up guilt shame remorse promising i would never drink again um and then, you know, a week later, two, a month later, I'm like, it's not going to be that, this time it's going to be different or whatever. And I'm drinking again and I'm stuck in the cycle, you know. And for me, that really illustrated the, like the, the, mental, the mental side of the disease, um, which is the insanity for me, um, which is um, knowing my track record of how, what happens. The fact that I think it's a good idea to drink again is freaking insane, you know. But my mind would convince me, like, this time it's not so bad. It's going to be different. I'll be able to control it. Um, and then I would hit that binge. And, it's, and then I would be like, I'm only going to buy this amount of alcohol. And I'd go to the bottle store. And I'd, I'd park outside just in case someone from AA is going to see me go in and buy some drinks. And then I'd go buy my drinks or whatever. I'd come home like, this is it. This is all I'm going to drink. And then I would drink that. And I'd be back in the bottle store. Back. And, I'm, and like, the compulsion, you know, like, once I start, I can't stop. And it, was, it'll, it would always be like, four days later, I wake up. Uh, my car, I don't know where my car is, um, my, I've got missed calls on my phone, and like my intention was just to drink a six pack, you know what I mean, I'm only going to drink a six pack. So for me that was like the compulsion side, you know, wake up, guilt, remorse, shame, uh, never going to drink again, good intentions, and then a week later I convinced myself again that I'm going to drink. Um, and it was a long time, you know, I got sober for about three years in that time, and it was a very painful three years. Um, and it got to the point where I was dating this girl and she was like, oh, it's been three years, you'll be fine. You know, just have a couple of drinks. And I'm like, that'll be fine. Whatever. So I go to this bar or whatever. And then I had a fancy drink and a fancy glass and another drink and another drink. And then 
I go to the bottle store, and I hadn't drunk for three years. I go to the bottle store, get a bottle of whatever, and then later I go to my dealer, and then four days later I wake up, I don't know where my car is. Um, and then, then, I, then I was like, okay, I need to go to rehab now. So I go to my boss, like, I'm, I'm an addict. She knew I was an addict. I relapsed, I need to go to rehab. I go to rehab. The whole time in rehab, I'm thinking, that wasn't a relapse, man. I was like a week. You know, like that wasn't, you know, that wasn't a good enough relapse or whatever. So then uh, I finish rehab. Uh, I go back to work and I'm like, I don't want to work anymore. I send through my resignation letter. Uh, I go to the bank. I get a loan. And I'm like, okay, now I'm going to relapse. You know? and, and then six, within a year or whatever, I end up waking up in Addington, hospital, which I'm, if any of you've been to is not a nice place, tied to the bed in my underwear, not knowing how the frick I got there. That's how I roll, right? That's how, I hadn't touched a drink in three years, but that's how I roll. That's what happens to me, you know? And I think something had happened and I got presented with the opportunity to come go on to the house on the hill, which I hated that place. I hated everybody went to that place. I wouldn't have nothing to do with that frickin' place. Um, but it was the only place left. <laughs> Uh, so eventually, so I went, you know, I went and it was made pretty clear to me that, uh, I, yeah, that I'd said those things. I thought no one really noticed, you know? Um, and I remember I was sitting in a group and I was getting concerned for, I was like, Bill W takes acid or whatever, like, why'd I have to listen to, like, whatever, I don't know, it was something like that or whatever. And, um, and, and, and I remember somebody saying, well, why don't you just leave? And I was like... I don't have anywhere to go, you know, like, so in that moment, I kind of realized, like, I'm fighting for the right to kill myself, you know, and then after that group, I remember I got it, and I was broken, and I was sitting on the stairs outside, and my sponsor came up to me, and I was crying or whatever, and uh, for me, I took my first three steps on those stairs, I didn't realize those were my first three steps, <coughs> but in hindsight, um, they were, because I was sitting on those stairs absolutely broken, and I had this overwhelming feeling that I was completely fucked because I'd tried everything. I tried controlling my drinking, I tried controlling my life through work, through money, through whatever, and it, I always end up in the same place, you know? And in that moment, that was my surrender because I knew that I was completely screwed and I had no more options left, you know? Um, and, uh, and I was sitting, sitting on the stairs with my sponsor and he said, you know, this is a good thing because it means you're, you're gonna change. And I took step two, because I looked at this person, and I'd known this person for a long time. And he'd stayed sober, and he, and, he, and he got married, and he had a job, and he had a life, you know? And I knew something had worked for him. And if that something had worked for him, that something could potentially work for me. That was my step two. And my step three was just like, tell me what to do, you know? And I got off those stairs, and I know some people, like, a spiritual awakening comes in many different forms, and for me, mine was pretty dramatic because I got up from those stairs and I was a changed person, you know? Like from that day forward, I, uh, I listened, I, I took suggestions, I was willing to try somebody else's way. Um, and it was beautiful, it was like, you know, some people go to church and they become reborn or whatever, like it was that kind of, you know, um, experience and I, and I treasure it for what it was, but it didn't last for forever, you know? <laughs> and um, real life kind of takes over again. Um, but, uh, so I finished, um, I finished my stint in uh, treatment. I went to the halfway house, I worked my steps, and then it was really just about living life, you know, learning how to live life using this program. And it was difficult because I struggle a lot with fear, a lot with anxiety and panic attacks and stuff. I have a lot of that, like, intense anxiety. And it was difficult, like, learning how to, to have a job again and, and, uh, just being, just showing up for life was was very challenging, um, and also a lot of a lot of my covering up my defect was uh, arrogance. You know, I used arrogance to cover a lot of my um, my 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 uh, my fear, and um, as a result, I had to get really humble and really uh, yeah, it was difficult. You know, it was difficult because I, I had this ego and I, and I didn't want to. I remember I went into the for my first job. I went to go was going to weigh tables and. I think I did one night and I was terrible because I was so nervous and the guy was like, 
He's like, you know, you, you're not good enough to be a waiter, but you can clean the tables. And I was like, shit. You know, and I'd run restaurants, you know, and uh, but I did it. I came back and I did that, and eventually I ended up managing that restaurant. And and then after about a year, I think for me the the big thing in my recovery was that I I had to walk through these fears, you know. So for me, it was getting a job and being responsible, and then eventually, like I got an opportunity to move to Cape Town, and um, yeah, you know, that was a big leap of faith, you know, and. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about higher power. Like for me, when I first got sober, I was into like the power of now and all these books and I wanted to understand what God was and whatever. And the longer I've stayed sober, the more it's just like, it's not, I'm only a human being. I, to me, for me to try to understand God and what God is, is it's never gonna happen, right? Um, so for me, I keep it real simple, you know? Um, for me, um, letting God work in my life is really just doing something and just trusting the process. That's, that's as simple as I can make it. That I'm going to do this thing and I, it's probably going to work out and I'm just going to have faith it's going to work out and that's, that's enough. That's, just, that's all I really need. I don't need to delve more because it just leaves me with more questions. And whether there's a God or there's not a God, I can't answer that question, but I can tell you that certain things have happened in my life that I can't explain, you know? Certain things have lined up in a way that I can't explain. Um, and maybe it's coincidence, I don't know, but things have happened. Um, and when I moved to Cape Town, things happened. You know, like I went from like not being able to get a job to like finding a job and then I had no place to stay. And then I happened to like the, the, the company that I hired me a job, they, that, I, that I got a job with, they had apartments that they would rent out to people for a few months when they first started working. And so all of a sudden I was like, okay, I'm in this new place and I'm going to new meetings. And of course I don't like the meetings because that's not how it was here. And I'm like judging and sharing at people indirectly and all this bullshit. And, um, and meanwhile, I'm getting myself into a mess because I actually need these people to stay sober. And again, like I hit rock bottom in sobriety and that's happened to me a few times um, where I hit rock bottom in sobriety, you know, and, um, I have to go and kind of do the basics again, which I had to do. I had to learn. I, I had to kind of, you know, lean on my sponsor, practice being of service to people and not trying to like tell people how to work their sobriety and focus on my stuff because, you know, like that's, you know, that's really all I, all I have control over. Um, and in the end it worked out well because I had this whole new experience and, um, so during this time, I had an opportunity to go to the States because I was adopted and my mother was, is in the States. I was adopted in the States and moved to South Africa when I was young. And I had this opportunity to go reconnect with my, with my biological mother, which I thought would be amazing. And during this time, um, I, uh, I don't know if any of you know Dot, but Don, he was like, well, why don't you go and have an experience? You know, and he was always kind of up... He was always, always, he was, he always said, you know, experiences is what sobriety is about. And I'm not that guy. I don't want to go have experiences. I just want to stay in my room and the curtains drawn and like play PlayStation, you know? Um, but I was like, you know, I only have one life. Let me go have an, let me, let me try to do this and have an experience. And during that time when I was working, I'd switched my reliance upon the fellowship and, and God to reliance upon work. And my boss, you know, she was like, oh, you're doing a great job. You're so good at what you do. And I was like, mm, I like that. I want more of that, you know. And that's the whole spiritual malady side as well. Like, I'm not okay, but, you know, the work's going to make me okay, you know. And I've had those periods in sobriety where I'll focus on other things. And at that stage, I was focusing on work and the affirmation I was getting. <coughs> and consequently, I burnt out because that's never going to fulfill me. And that's what's caused me the rock bottom is when I look for other things and, I, and I'm getting it from other things, it always leads me back to that dark hole, you know? Um, so anyway, so I, I got into a plane with like $2,700, I remember the amount, it's like $2,740 that I'd saved, not knowing anybody in America besides like my mom and a few other people. And uh, it was scary, you know, it was freaking scary. I got, you know, I got there, I arrived. It didn't go as, as planned with my mom. She's not a nice person. Uh, I didn't know this, um, and I found that out very quickly, which was disappointing. It was disappointing, and I don't understand. It's insane to me 
to give birth to somebody and then not want to have anything to do with them. I, that I cannot fathom. But anyway, um, so that didn't really work out. Uh, and then after a week, I got into a train down to San Francisco and not knowing anybody. But I did, did what I always knew how to do. I got off, I started going to meetings. Um, I eventually, I connected with this really strong men's group and they took me in. They, they took me in, they helped me get a job, find a place to stay. And you know, I, that group's very special to me to this day. You know, um, They have retreats every year. I, I try to go when I can. Um, and my first four, four or five months in San Francisco was, was great, you know, it really like, I got introduced to the country and, and the meetings and, uh, you know, was working and everything and I was doing it, you know what I mean? I was, I was able to start a whole new life, you know, and then after about five, six months, I decided to move on to Los Angeles where a friend of mine I knew from high school, I owed him amends. Um, and yeah, so I got to stay with him for a while. I got to make amends to him. Again, one thing led to another, and before I knew it, I was like running an Airbnb for somebody. Um, yeah, and that's been my experience as well. Like every time I've leaned into life, things have, things have kind of started to happen, you know? And again, for me, that's, that's God for me, is like leaning into life and just seeing what life can give you. Um, through that experience, I started working for somebody and then I started my own business. I'm a recruiter, a headhunter. I work in entertainment. Uh, it's crazy. I was living in, a Holly, in the Hollywood Hills in Los Angeles. It was like, how did I? Like, if you ask me you know, the first week I got sober to like write down what I'm going to do, how my life's going to look, there's no ways I would have come up with that, you know? Um, and uh, I started, I work in entertainment. I work in like the movie trailer world. Um, and I've spent time building up my own business over the last how many years? Eight, nine years, seven years. Um, but again, I, I reached a crossroads again because now there was the writers and actors strike this year, so business kind of got really slow. And then I'm like, oh, I have time to kind of peek up for, for a breath of fresh air. And I'm like, I realized like the last few years, like I've been totally obsessed with like making money and building my business and like that's where all my energy has been going into not to say that i haven't been doing meetings and everything i've been doing those things um but it was just a kind of a realization um that again like all my worth is wrapped up in making money but now i'm not making any money this year and then i feel worthless and i'm like oh it's because i've been focusing on the wrong things again you know um which has happened to me several times in in sobriety and it doesn't really upset me because I don't need to this whole idea of like when I first got sober it was very important to me to be a spiritual guru I wanted to be that guy who knows everything can quote everything and whatever and I've kind of done a complete 180 like I insist on being a human being which means that I'm just I'm not perfect like I'm gonna say inappropriate things I'm gonna be opinionated sometimes and that's totally okay. That's why I have a program to work. I'd rather live that way and make mistakes than try to live in this little rigid box trying to be perfect. Because if you're too rigid, you're gonna snap, you're gonna break, you know? So these things happen in my life, I don't judge them. It's just, it's life, you know? Sometimes you get distracted and you can always come back. It's not, whereas in the beginning, it was like a travesty if like, I had a resentment, oh my God, I've got a fucking resentment. I'm gonna like relapse and, you know? Um, and that's also been my experience in sobriety. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't care about being a spiritual guru. I don't, I'm not interested. In fact, when I listen to someone share and they've got all together, like I want nothing to do with that because that I cannot relate to. I've had periods in my, in my sobriety where I've wanted to drink every day for like a year. I wanted to drink, you know, and I was ashamed to share about that stuff, you know, because like I shouldn't be feeling this way, but that's my story. My story was for a year in sobriety. I wanted to drink every day, but you know what? I didn't. And that's the message I have to carry. Even though I wanted to drink every day, I didn't. And I didn't throw away all of that time I had because I just, I knew eventually something would, would break or I'd reach a kind of a new revelation. Um, and so now I'm on, a, I'm on a new journey now, you know, like things were quiet at work. I decided, okay, well, I might as well take this time to do something new. I bought a place here a few years ago. Let me come try to live here for a while and just see how it goes, you know? And uh, maybe kind of connect again with the fellowship that I first got sober with and sponsor some people again and just bring it back to basics, you know? And I'm sure by doing that, I'll probably feel a lot better. Um, 
because I've achieved all those things that I've wanted to achieve um, materialistically, you know? Like I've made the money, I've, I've bought the property, I've, I've done those things and, and I needed to do them to see that they don't, you know, um, they don't make me happy, you know? And it's usually the simple things of like carrying a message to somebody, being of service, um, that where, where my, my sense of, of gratitude comes from. Um, and I've been talking too much, so I'm going to end it there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.